Thank you for listening to Positively Trek. And we want to give a shout out to our patrons on Patreon, including Carl Morris, Joyce Marin, Jim Stoffel, Dave Garcia, Rick Young, and Paul D. Kinnear. We want to thank you for your contributions to the podcast. Now, if you would like to be a patron on Patreon, you can join us at patreon.com slash positively trek, where you get early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, and associate producer credits. So thank you again for listening. And now let's fly. I don't have time for this. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your little quest. Captain Ahab has to go hunt his whale. What? You do have books in the 24th century. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of the Positively Trek Book Club. I'm Dan Gunther. With me, as always, is Bruce Gibson. Bruce, this is a big episode. I'm really excited about this one. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm, I'm equal parts excited, equal parts dreading this, because we are talking about the first book of the Coda trilogy. Yes, I love how you started off by saying another exciting episode, because that means we've had more than one, right? And this is the next one. <laughs> But I mean, odds are, right? Yeah. At some point. And I know this will be an exciting episode. I have been looking forward to this trilogy for quite a while. And I've been just as excited about this as just getting a new season of something or whatever. When people are like, oh, a new season of Lower Decks or whatever's coming. I'm just like, yeah, but we also have the Coda trilogy coming. Come on. That's just mm-hmm. as big. So I'm excited to dive into this. Yeah, definitely. And that sound you heard was, you know, a ton of Star Trek fans just gasping because, you know, when you bring up the Coda trilogy for longtime readers of Star Trek literature, they know what that is if they've been paying attention and following along. And it's the wrap up of 20 years of this shared lit verse continuity. And There are three authors responsible for bringing this trilogy to us. Now, in this episode, we're only talking about the first book, Moments Asunder, by Dayton Ward, and we do have the man himself here to talk about it. Dayton, welcome back to Positively Trek. Hey guys, how's it going? Pretty good, I think, for the most part. I'm I'm a little shattered after reading this novel, but not bad. Shattered. Shattered. <laughs> I'm doing good with okay. this. I mean, I like I said, I've been excited about this book, and I'm just gonna be upfront and tell you. I know we keep people keep saying it, and we keep saying, Oh, this is the final story of this time period, this this continuity. But I never believe in endings are forever. I feel like there's gonna be something more after this at some point. And I'm not asking you to answer that. I'm just saying I just firmly believe this is not really the end. I mean, the end of Star Trek novels? No, of course not. There's going to be Star Trek novels for as long as there's Star Trek. But I mean of this continuity. I think we'll revisit this at some point. But don't say anything to it. I mean, I'm just saying. I don't believe it's the end. That's all it's I'm saying. It's good to have dreams. No, I'm kidding. Smith's <laughs> with <laughs> Well, I'm really excited to talk about this novel. And uh, to our listeners out there, I should tell you, we will be getting into spoilers for this novel, Moments Asunder, uh, later on. We'll start out spoiler free, but I'm going to let you know at the top of the show, there will be no spoilers for books two and three. So if you're worried about that, uh, no worries on that count. We're only talking about the first novel. We might speculate a little bit, but of course, Dayton is not going to be uh, giving any indication on that as much as we would love him to slash hate him to but you know you know how it is with spoilers guys so yeah don't worry about spoilers for those books i will happily sit here and listen in silence while you speculate (laughs) excellent well i mean star trek fans love nothing more than to speculate but uh let's just start first with the genesis of this whole coda thing and I mean, you know, 20 years in the making, right? We've had this whole uh, lit verse starting with the Deep Space Nine novel Avatar book one, the relaunch back in 2001. It's 20 years later. Uh, the Trek authors in that time have had this tremendous amount of leeway to craft this unique and expansive extended Star Trek universe. How did it feel to have the responsibility to help close out this chapter of the Star Trek novel verse? Well, I mean, it's it's a daunting challenge because you're never going to, no matter which way we opt to go, um, somebody's going to be feeling betrayed, disappointed, sad, angry. I mean, uh, we and we knew that going in. It was like, I, I, there's really just no way 
to do this in such a manner that everybody will be happy. All we can do is give it our, you know, our best full faith effort in the spirit of the novels that have been written all these years and, and, and then lay it out there. And it's up to the readers to decide, you know, if it was, if it was a worthy investment of time and energy over the course of, and money over the course of, you know, what, almost 20 years of reading for those who have been here the entire time. And, you know, uh, or those, you know, fans who've discovered the books later and then, you know, binge them all or however they've done it, or they've heard about this trilogy and they decided to check out a few of the past books to see what the fuss is about. All those people are being, or hopefully being considered while we put this thing together. So yeah, it's quite the challenge. I mean, as far as collaborations go, I, I would, I would rank this right up there as far as the most challenging collaboration I've in which I've ever taken part. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you of course have had a lot of experience doing novel collaborations over the years, writing Star Trek. I mean, Van, Guards, Seekers, The Fall, Legacies, and, and so many others as well. How was this experience compared to those? What were kind of some of the unique challenges you faced here? Well, I mean, again, there's all the history involved. Um, usually those other efforts are, are within themselves contained. You know, it's, it's a mini series or it's a you know, limited series or it's a duology or it's something like that. This is a little different because the stakes, we, at least in our minds, much higher. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about transitioning a narrative that is unfolded over multiple series and sets of characters over a great many years and trying to do it in a fashion that honors what came before and sets people up to continue, you know, watching the new shows and and then not feeling like, well, I don't have to read any more Star Trek novels because they've closed out everything. It's like, well, no, we would prefer, you know, we would actually like to have you come along for the ride on the next, whatever the next phase will be of Star Trek novels. So that was a consideration, you know, and, and a lot of people have likened what we're doing to what happened with uh, Star Wars and its expanded universe or Doctor Who and its novels that took place, you know, that were published during that gap, you know, when there was no Doctor Who being created up until 2005, 2006, fans of the Star Wars expanded universe, you know, there were, there was not an insignificant number of those readers who felt shafted, you know, when Disney acquired Lucasfilm and just proclaimed all, all those cool novels and comics, which were supposedly some version of canon legends. And, you know, they just sort of basically just stopped. It was just, they put a, they put up a wall and said, that's it for those books. We're going to start fresh. We did not want to do that with the Star Trek novels. We, we wanted to do something that would pay a proper tribute to what we have been allowed to do. And it's important to say that we've been allowed to do that over these, you know, over these 20 years. Um, we just had, a, we had what I consider to be a, maybe not totally unprecedented, but, you know, largely unprecedented free reign you know, or at least freer reign to do what we could do in these books than we would normally have had if the shows were in active production. It's not something we took lightly. I'm glad that you guys had the opportunity to do this. And I know it's because you asked to do it. You wanted to do it. It wasn't that Vi Viacom CBS came to you and said to do this, right? Or the, it was something that you guys came up with. We came up with the idea to find a way to transition or, and we, we made the pitch both to our editors at gallery books and, you know, CBS, Viacom CBS. They were all on board to a person. Uh, they were like, yes, go forth and write, go, go, go. And in fact, their, their directive was basically, like I said in my afterward, it was, you know, swing for the fences, which is kind of how we looked at it. We're like, well, you know, we can be upset about this or we can view it as a creative challenge and we can just go for it because what's going to happen? What's, what, what's the alternative? Don't do anything. So uh, yeah, they were very supportive. They were in our corner the entire time. Well, I was at Dragon Con years ago when Disney made the announcement about buying Star Wars and that they were going to turn that EU line into uh, Legends. And Timothy Zahn was at this panel. Someone asked him the question of like, how are you going to, you know, how, are you upset about this? And he's like, well, no, I mean, as tie-in authors, you know, we know this is going to happen. He's like, but at the same time, it's our job to figure out how to tie it all in. So it's right. up to us to figure out how to tie legends into the canon, which hasn't been done. But then you guys have had the opportunity, opportunity to do that with Star Trek. So that's pretty great. And it's the same feeling. It's not like, uh, you know, it's, I'm not bitter, or angry, upset or anything like that. It's if, when you write books like this, you go in with the expectation that something you've written is going to eventually be overwritten you know, either by something on screen or by another book or, you know, something that's just the nature of the, of, of what we do. It's, you know, we, as, as 
not to be flippant about it, but it's like we knew the job was dangerous when we took it. Um, I mean, I've had books that I've written over the years that have been superseded by events on screen uh, from one of the shows or one of the movies. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, uh, Star Trek novels have been getting that treatment for, well, since there have been Star Trek novels. <laughs> so even going all the way to the back to the first one. So it's not new. What is new, or at least what's different about this one, is that you know it comes at a time after we had been given such an unprecedented amount of time to do the things that we were allowed to do in the books. You know, even Star Wars, Star Wars novels did not proceed for that length of time before somebody stepped in and went, well, we're going to do things a little differently now, or we're going to, we're going to shut things off. I think that's what sets Star Trek, this, these Star Trek books and the Star Trek novel line and the lit verse uh, apart from Star Wars expanded universe and the Doctor Who novels is that it's just the length of time we were allowed to go about our business. Because, hey, there was never going to be any return to the 24th century. We were never going to see Captain Picard again. Never. Never going to see Janeway again. Never. Ever, ever, ever. Until you do. See, mm-hmm. that's why I don't believe in endings. You never right. know what could happen in the future. I mean, but, I, mean I, I think we're just creative. I mean, in entertainment in general, the, 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 uh, the desire to revisit, reboot, reimagine, restart, you know, pick up revive i mean there's all these different permutations a property that has been dormant for some time is just it it seems like it's at an all-time high right now you know i look at the listings on my tv and i'm like well let's see there's episodes there's new episodes of swat magnum pi y50 what year is this again you know (laughs) so it's just it's just insane fantasy island bsi (laughs) you know it's like uh you know it's just like and i mean part of me as a fan of some of those properties, it's fun to revisit them. You know, I'm like, okay, I was, cause I came up in the eighties when they were always doing, you know, reunion movies from, of reunion TV movies for TV shows from the prior decades. So like, you know, the return of the man from uncle, the return of the $6 million man, return of the wild, wild west. And don't forget the rescue of Gil- Gilligan's Island. Rescue from Gilligan's right? Island. So it's one. not like this is a new idea. It just seems like it's more more prevalent today so yeah on the one hand that's it's it's interesting but uh you know so the idea of revisiting aspects of star trek uh particularly if the actors are willing and able and excited to do it you know how do you say no to something like that how do you not pursue that option if it's available but when that bomb drops it says oh star trek picard and you look at it and you go oh crap okay what are we gonna do now <laughs> let me ask Oddly you oddly enough that is Almost verbatim. Well, I mean, you might want to swap out one of the words for ratings, but that's pretty much what I said. (laughs) Um, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Was your stomach churning? You know, because I'm also curious to know if you had ideas of where you were going in this continuity that you had to go, well, I guess we're not doing that now. Yeah, to all of that. I mean, I knew about Picard the show months before it was announced in Vegas. Uh, Kirsten Beyer had on the down low informed me that they had been courting Patrick Stewart to return to the fold and it was looking pretty good. And of course, and right as we were having that conversation on the phone one night, I'm, I'm already, my brain is already starting to think about, well, that could be a problem for the books. And, you know, it was another year or so before we started to really see what that meant. Uh, you know, cause it took a while to get a premise and, uh, and then Kirsten had created a document for the writing staff as sort of a Star Trek primer. And it was, all the high, a lot of the high points from previous Star Trek shows and Star Trek history, but also some bits of backstory that they were creating for Picard, you know, to inform his first season. So I'm reading this document. I think it's in the spring of 2019, and I'm reading about the Mars attack in 2385, and I'm going, well, that's a bomb that just detonated in our backfield, uh, you know, because the books are at 2386, and this event that is a huge motivator for the action in season one of Picard is in our past as well now. So it's like, well, how do we do that? You know, there's the, there's the first big challenge. That's how, so immediately the scope of the problem began to expand. Uh, Maybe not problem. The scope of the challenge began to expand. And um, so that's when Dave Mack and Jim Swallow and I started talking. Dave and I talked at a convention later that year, like it was in July of, of 2019 at the Shirley convention. We, we discussed notes and, you know, as it's, as I say in the afterward, you know, he, he was thinking about about one thing I was thinking along similar lines, but my advantage was I had read the scripts for the, for Picard season one. So I had information, or at least I was, I was reading information about the show that he did not have access to. 
So I was able to say, dude, you know, <laughs> we have our work cut out for us. Um, so that's when the three of us started uh, batting around ideas. And uh, in fact, originally we were, we were thinking it might even be more books than that. We were hoping to have four and perhaps even five books in what we call the core storyline. But we were also thinking um, we might do one or two books that acted as stealth prequels or stealth setup books. Like they would come off as regular next gen or ds9 books but once you started reading the actual core storyline you realized that we had already moved pieces onto the board in such a way it was kind of like the books that led up to destiny you know like greater than the sum and those those other books those three or four book resistance and a couple other books that set up destiny we were going to do that but we were going to do it in such a way that you had no clue what was coming you know it was like oh 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 wait a minute what 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 he set that up in that other book that was the idea um, we had to scale back obviously, but when we started playing around like, okay, where is everything at in the lit verse right now? And we're looking at all the major high points and stuff. And we're like, you know, there are, there are things you talk about ideas, not used, you know, we had things going on in the different books that we're looking at each other and we're going, you know, if we do this right, people are going to think we've been planning this for years because we can pick up this plot thread and we can weave it into here. We can pick up this bit and weave it into there. And, and they'll think we've been planning this for six or seven years at this point. If we, if we, do our, you know, we play our cards right. Uh, we were able to fold in a couple of dangling plot threads that we were introduced in some of the books. And those were not my original plans for those plot threads, speaking to the next gen specific ones, but we're like, well, I can repurpose the idea and we'll, we'll just fold it in here. Cause you worked with the other authors uh, to kind of run some of these ideas by them, right? Not the ones that you're oh, working yeah. with on this trilogy, but the ones who contributed to this continuity in their other. We books. did. We we you know we we were looking at stuff and we were we were trying to decide. Okay, well, th this is where you know this is where this this particular character is at. This is where events were left off with this storyline. This is what happened with over here. We had certain things we could do. And we had certain things we were asked not to do. There were other things that we didn't do because the author of a particular bit of the lore had. You know, so I, I like the way I left things. Would you mind just not destroying that or something? And we're like, we can do that. You know, or, you know, we will do that if it, at all possible. And then there's some of the stuff that I did in the next gen books that were after the fall, like when the, when the enterprise goes out into the Odyssean past and starts exploring, I had started dropping little bits that I thought I might follow up in subsequent books. And I'm like, well, not going to get to do that. So we'll find a way to repurpose those ideas and, and bring them into this storyline. I think notably, of course, uh, the one that pops into my head of that we've talked about before was the whole uh, Torek getting a glimpse of, of some future events and how that kind of got we woven into this story. here. There's, there's that one. There's the alternate Enterprise crew. Uh, you that, know, that was clever. And, I love that. <laughs> uh, it was just there were a couple other things that I had hoped to revisit in other books or I'd thought I might revisit in other books if the circumstances allowed uh, and just the way the books unfolded. And then, you know, as far, like I said, as far back as 2018, I knew that we were going to uh, do this. So available, you know, available light was the last next gen book I wrote before this one. And I wrote that knowing the card was coming, you know, and then Dave was writing collateral damage, which was going to basically close out that aspect of the storyline. So we were like, okay, well, let's, so we were already starting to move things into position. Even if you all didn't know that, I mean, that's not, we didn't we didn't get one over on anybody we were just like we might as well move these pieces into position at the end of these two books that way the decks are somewhat clear for when we get going on coda because we're not going to have a lot of time or space to do these sorts of setup things if nothing else just making your job easier when you when kind you of sort of yeah i mean that wasn't the intention when we both got drafted to write those two novels it was just like well all right but we know what's coming so you know and then so dave you know closed out the picard and section 31 storyline so that it wouldn't be hanging over our heads, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed in this novel, uh, you did an afterword kind of going over a bunch of this and talking about a lot of this. And and I want to stress to the people listening, I know we have listeners who have told me that they don't tend to read the acknowledgements or about the author or any of that stuff. I, I would definitely urge people to read that uh, because you know, we're all Star Trek fans. We all love this story. There's reason we've been reading these books for 20 years. And the authors are Star Trek fans as well. And Dayton, in particular, your, um, I want to say like a mix of giddiness as well as like a realization of the awesome responsibility really comes through in that. And I, it, it, it really 
put me in your shoes as a Star Trek fan who is writing this stuff. And, and I really appreciated that. I thought that was a really great insight into the process and what was going on to craft this trilogy. Well, thanks very much. I don't know that I'd call myself giddy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I was ever giddy at any point in this project. Once we realized what we had to do and what we had to work with, and it was just like, well, you know, go for YOLO, go for broke. We're going to, you know, we're never going to get mm. this opportunity again. So let's make the most of it. Maybe enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. I don't know. D- d- determination <laughs> to do it right. I mean, you know, d- d- that's kind of how we, we, we all approached it was like, let's just not screw this up too badly or, you know. Let's let's try not to screw this up too badly. It, yeah, it was uh, more trepidation than anything else. And then, you know, being <laughs> I am I was in the unusual position of being the leadoff hitter this time around. Uh, mm-hmm. Normally I back clean up and uh, or at least I had in the last couple of times that we collaborated on something. And so that's a little petrifying <laughs> to terrifying. Uh, it, you know, Dave and Jim are hard acts to follow, let alone, you know, try to lead off for them. No, it was a lot of fun. I mean, Jim and Dave are very, you know, we all have egos. We all have, you know, that sort of thing. But it was a very, very satisfying collaboration all the way through. A lot of fun. We had a lot of fun behind the scenes. Our our our, our instant message channel on Twitter was ridiculous. We, we would spend hours just throwing crap at each other. And then we would have regular Skype calls throughout the outlining of this thing. We, we beat out everything and then we wrote our outlines and then we went to our corners to write the manuscript. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun behind there. In fact, we even, you know, we we even christened ourselves the, the our new, you know, death metal band, uh, Wormhole Death Cannon with one end. Uh, that's going to be our, we had t-shirts made and everything. We're just, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Oh, excellent. I would love, I mean, I know there's no possible way ever, but to get a glimpse at that. In due, in due time, you will see this because, uh, you know, we, uh, I don't, it's not spoiling anything to say that we had t-shirts made, but we also put... <laughs> a tour list on the back of the shirt of all the places that you go in the three books. So obviously you cannot, obviously we're not going to show that until book three is out. So, and it's, it's just, we were, we were, that was just one of those late night, early morning, depending on which time zone you're in. Um, Because, you know, I'm in the central time zone, Dave's in the Eastern and Jay and uh, Jim's in the UK. So there were some, there were some oddball hours. So it was like, yeah, we're getting kind of punchy. Let's have a little fun with this. So I think I referred to it in my afterward, the the death metal band. I would love, I have so many questions that I can't ask because. <laughs> you I can ask I, anything you want. No, I will no. <laughs> I'll choose whether or not to answer. But Because there's just, uh, I, I mean, I really feel like we need to do a follow-up when all three books are out because. There's mm-hmm. things I want to really delve into, but I know it's like, you know, we have to finish out the story. So Yeah. And I mean, I, I set some things into motion that, you know, at first blush, you're like, well, why did you do that? And like, you know, the, 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 the trite answer is read books two and three. You'll, you'll, some of that stuff will pay off in books two and three. So, but, you know, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anything in those books because Jim and Dave deserve their chance to, to talk about their books, you know, freely. For sure. Well, let's dive into this book. And, uh, you know, we've gone this far. We haven't really talked about the story at all. So I kind of want to start with the sort of central character for much of this this novel, and that's Wesley Crusher. Uh, he plays a significant role in the story, of course, thanks to his uh, identity as a traveler. And he's been tracking the central enemy of this book through time uh, and reunites with his mother and the Enterprise crew, of course. I'm curious about the backstory of the character before we see him here. Uh, he, we kind of come to him at an interesting couple points in his life, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, how has his history with the Travelers gone up until this point? And, and what has brought him to this point that we find him here in the novel? Oh. Or these points, I guess, because there's a couple versions we see of him. And already we're talking about aspects of the storyline that will be revealed. Um, you know, it's Fair just, enough. I told you it's hard, <laughs> right? It is hard. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I know that I knew that I knew it's, it's, it's hard to talk about book one in isolation. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot more to find out about Wesley is all I can say right now. It's, 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 uh, I, I basically introduce you to him at two different, vastly different points in his life separated by depending on your point of view, how, you know, it could be 40 years, it could be 400 years. It just depends on how time is perceived. And of course, Wesley has that ability to step in and out of time as we understand it. And that was 
that's that is definitely something that will not go untapped in books two and three. On the topic of Wesley Crusher, the what I like about this book is that Dan and I have gone back and started to reread a lot of these twenty fourth century novels when we were on literary treks and we hit the Time Two series and I hadn't read the that series when it originally came out. But you know, when that series started, Wesley Crusher was a big part of that in the first couple of books. And this almost feels like the right ending to bring that back because in a lot of ways I feel like that series, in addition to DS9 Avatar, is the kind of the one that skip that kind of kicked off this whole continuity. And so it makes sense that Wesley be here to just kind of end it because of the abilities he has. And so I guess I'm wondering why you chose Wesley Crusher to be that central character. Well, we needed a character. We, we decided that we wanted a character that could step outside of time or travel through time or look at time differently than than humans can or, hum, or you know, our regular characters can. And, and that narrows the list considerably. But Wesley was the obvious choice because of his connection to our characters and in particular, you know, Dave and Jim and I were talking about how we could really examine his relationship with Renee, his his stepbrother. It was interesting to do that. Plus, you know, Will Wheaton was about the right age in our head of, you know, if we were actually going to have this as a film, he's he's just about the right age for the for the Wesley that runs through the bulk of my book. Um, you know, maybe scraggle him up a little bit and give him a cool leather jacket. But that's that was kind of the idea. It was like, okay, he, of, of the characters out there that we can play with and are available he's the one that provided us with the most interesting opportunities in terms of, you know, who he is, what he means to the crew and just the idea of, you know, Will Wheaton temporal badass has a, has kind of a nice ring to it. I like that. Will Wheaton temporal badass. There's your title for the show right yes, there. I'm thinking right? Exactly. The thing. <laughs> yep. You described my, my mental process reading this novel too, which was like, okay, Will Wheaton beard, scraggly hair, cool duds okay there we go as as he looks now and it was perfect i kind of had him a bit, but obviously rougher because he's had a hard life as a traveler and dealing with this specific problem i kind of look at him as like like will wheaton by way of sam elliott you know? <laughs> or <laughs> snake Pliskin, or you know it's just like he's been road hard and put away wet too many times um that's kind of how i looked at him i just you know the, he's a wanderer he's uh in this truest sense, you know, through time. So that's kind of how I did it. Awesome. Yeah. That, that, that fits perfectly. I also love the aspect of his story of, uh, and, and I'm going to give the warning here. We're getting into spoilers depending on how people, how much people want to be spoiled or not. If you've read anything of the book, we're going to be talking about the plot now and stuff. So, uh, we do get this, uh, very elderly Wesley, who's been doing this for hundreds of years, it seems very quickly, like he dies and we get a younger Wesley, this more contemporary one that we're kind of talking about here. And I love the the aspect of the story where the older one has kind of left clues and the younger Wesley has to kind of follow his path, but not make the same mistakes he did. And hopefully the outcome will be different. I thought... That was really fascinating and uh, I, something echoed in my mind because right now my wife and I are doing a watch through of Quantum Leap and I totally had the put right that what <laughs> something that once went wrong going through my head while we were, uh, while I was reading this novel. So what kind of inspired that aspect of the storyline? Uh, I don't know that Quantum Leap was a conscious inspiration, but I mean, I've watched the show. It's just been a number of years since I've seen it because we're leaning into the idea that there are multiple timelines that are in danger mm -hmm. right now and including multiple versions of timelines that we have seen in other productions, whether we're talking on screen or in the novel. So the idea that different versions of Wesley could have been fighting this, this conflict over, you know, an unknown amount of time and coming up short on multiple occasions and then learning, you know, another iteration of him learns from the mistakes of the predecessor was kind of fascinating it's but at the same time it's kind of maddening to try to keep it all straight in your head even though you try to write it down and you have a flow chart or something it's just like wow which wesley am i writing about today uh you know it's just it's it's definitely time travel stories are hard anyway um but in this kind in this case we kind of just sort of like here's a time travel story on steroids and it's not just what i'm writing but you know how i'm writing book one what impact will it have on books two and three you know, and, you know, what am I, what am I leaving for Jim to pick up? And what is Jim going to have to do with that and leave things for Dave to pick up? And then Dave has to tie it all in a big bow 
at the end of it. And hopefully we, you know, we, we, if we did our jobs right, then he has everything he needs to do that. Yeah. It's just, it's just, I don't know, insanity. <laughs> That's what drove that idea. I think. One thing I liked about book one, well, there's many things I liked. I'm just going to tell you about the one thing I liked about book one is I was afraid that when I would go into these books, you guys would be throwing all these things at us that one chapter is this crew, the next chapter is the other crew. The other, It's like, you know, all these different things are going on. This felt like a TNG book. I mean, it felt almost like it could be a standalone book, except it's not totally resolved at the end. So I appreciated how it had that right pacing to it. It didn't feel rushed. I mean, we do visit different aspects of some crews here and there, but it felt like a TNG book. And I just wondered if, and again, without trying to get into books two and three, but was that a conscious decision of let's set this up and focus on TNG with this book? Yes, it was. I mean, the, the next gen crew will factor into all, all three books, but I, I mean, just, you can just look at the covers for books two and three and you can get a sense of who's going to be a major player in, in that storyline, in that book's particular story or, you know, their book, their portion of the storyline. So, you know, DS9 and the Aventine are on books two, books two covers. Um, so obviously I would, I would put my money on, you're going to see folks from DS9 and the Aventine. And which again, but 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 the next gen crew is going to be a major player throughout all three storylines. Yes, that was a conscious decision to sort of light the fuse in book one with one one set of characters, and then kind of let it expand into books two, and then even if, even further into book three. So it's like a just a, a blossom blossoming effect as the series unfolds. I would argue of the three books, I I may have I may have had the easiest job, or at least in hindsight, it'll come out looking like I had the easiest job. I mean, I joked the other day when somebody was upset with me because of events that happened in book one. I'm like, now bear in mind that book one is this the trilogy's lowest intensity setting because <laughs> you know D jim is coming along and he's got a big bat and then here comes dave and we all know what dave could do when given carte blanche you know uh so if you're upset with me just wait for two months you know then you'll be mad at all of us <laughs> and, and i'm pretty sure i can outrun both of those guys so we'll see how it happens <laughs> Yeah, I, I've seen that comment that this one is probably like the lowest intensity one, which is really saying something. Because... I mean, I, I guess it depends on your point of view and which characters mean the most to you and, you know, which ones you're particularly invested in. But overall, I mean, as an, as a whole, yeah, I just every every book is going to crank it up just a little bit more. And, and then, of course, Dave's going to blow the subwoofer. So it's going to be a ride. If you're mad at me, like I said, if you're mad at me, just wait a couple of months. You'll forget I even exist. So, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I've got to ask, just kind of even separate from the events of the novels and just speaking as an author that's that's taking part in this trilogy, how frustrating is it to you sometimes when people are making assumptions based on things that happen in this book and, you know, they're you can't tell them what's going to happen, but they're, they're already kind of have their nose bent out of joint because of something that, you know, is going to go one way and they think it's totally another way. I'm not, I don't take any particularly, in, in, I, don't, I don't take any particular enjoyment from the idea. Like I'm not laughing behind the scenes at them or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's not that it's, it's, you know, I, I look at it as a compliment that they are so invested in the story and these characters that they are going off on these tangents and they're coming up with these ideas and they're trying to figure out, you know, what moves we're going to make. I'm not making fun of anybody and I'm not laughing at anybody. I, I, I am intrigued by some of the speculation. Some stuff is, some stuff is way off. Um, some stuff is pretty close to the mark. Uh, a couple of things are not on the mark, but they're running parallel to the mark. It's really interesting to see the different, ideas that are being cast about a lot of imagination being expended by people who are talking about this and you know and, and there's, there's a couple of times where they said something i'm like damn that was a good idea i wish we thought of that <laughs> you know <clears throat> i mean it was i mean but again I, I i that speaks that speaks to the commitment and the passion of the people who read these books when they go into that they invest that much into just speculating where the story could be going so we talked earlier just a moment ago about choosing wesley crusher Okay, tell us how you guys came up with the concept of who to make as the villain of the novel. Again, it was a it was a, a desire to do something that had not been done, or at least had not been done for a long while in in Star Trek, and we did not want to invent a threat that had never been seen before. We decided we could. There's somebody, something in the lore somewhere lends itself to what we're doing. 
Um, and the question is who, who's there that hasn't been overused or who's there that hasn't been used in a very long time. And I was surprised that, that, that the Davidians had been left largely untouched over all these years. Um, I mean, I think they've been referenced in a couple of things, but I don't know that there's, I can't recall offhand any stories that, and we couldn't, neither one of us, we were like, I don't remember any stories where they really factor as the heavies in, you know, in a, in a comic, I think they showed up in a comic. They were in a, they were in a comic book series or a comic book mini series or something way back when, but that's it. I mean, I, I, so we were like, okay, well, these folks are largely undefined. There's a lot of room for us to run, but yet there's a connection to previously established lore that we can draw on and just extrapolate and expand and take it and things that, you know, take it in directions that the, that the show couldn't do. That was our motivation was to just, not spend a lot of time inventing a new threat and then having to explain it and, and having to draw it out and, and all that sort of stuff. waste valuable time in the, you know, page space, you know, explaining a new threat. Uh, it was more fun to do it this way. Like, man, that's what those bastards have been doing all these years. They've been really screwing us around. We didn't even know it. That was the idea. Yeah. I, I love the kind of introduction of them as the villain here. Like, Time's Arrow, they kind of flew under the radar for me years ago when I watched those, those episodes, but recently re-watching them, I found myself kind of really wondering, what are these guys up to? What are they doing now? Where have they been? And I love the idea that the Department of Temporal Investigations, they say they've been keeping an eye on them. But mm. then over the course of the novel, we figure out that keeping an eye on them means <laughs> retroactively finding out bad things they've done and then linking it to them because they can't watch them because they're out of phase. Right. Like, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it just, it just, it just provided us with uh, an avenue to get this thing going. I mean, they were always, they were, like you said, they were kind of a low key bad guy, you know, even in their own episodes, they were, they were there. And then that was it. We never heard from them again, but yet the way they introduced them and the way they left things I was like, well, why couldn't we revisit them? And I, like I said, I was honestly surprised that nobody had, had come up with a, a big Davidian book or a big Davidian adventure other than that one. Like I said, that one is a two or three parter in, in the comics. And we're talking like the DC comics. So late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in that neighborhood, probably mid to mid, probably mid 90s, I think. But it's been that long. It wasn't an obvious choice. And as far as I know, because I was reading stuff in the run-up to the first book's release. Nobody guessed that we were going with the Davidians. At least nobody that I, whose comments I saw in my social media, uh, I don't think anybody, at least where I could see it, had had postulated the Davidians. So I was, we were kind of happy with that, that that part kind of caught people by surprise, or at least a lot of people by surprise. Yeah, I was just wondering as I was reading the book too that, you know, I was like, have we seen the Davidians before? And I just looked it up. It was a DC comic from 1995, Convergence. That's the one. Yeah. Hmm. So I think Gary Seven's in that too, if I remember correctly. So yes, it's just you're correct. Yep. Uh, yeah, I remember it vaguely. You know, as we talk about this book, we're talking about the 24th century continuity that's coming to an end. And this book is the coda to that. But wouldn't you say that this book or these books are also answer the questions as to why there's different continuities between different properties like online in the comics and such. Isn't that kind of an, a, res, a resolution to why those don't fit into Picard? Maybe. See, I knew my questions <laughs> were ones that I can't ask yet, but no, I what I mean is, I mean, there's a, there's a scene in the end toward the end of the book one where they start to describe how time branches and, you know, there are different timelines that do this and, 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 and certain timelines are more fragile than others. And the Davidians are preying on the more fragile ones, but as they, as their need to consume is remains unsatiated, they keep going for the thicker, more riper, you know, more ripe uh, branches of the timeline of, of time. And so it's not difficult to extrapolate or it's, I don't think it's unreasonable to extrapolate that. Well, why couldn't Star Trek online be one of those other branches? Well, you know, why couldn't the gold key comics be one of those other branches? By the way, that is true. They are there. The gold key has its own branch. And in every single one of the permutations of different timelines that may be created or destroyed throughout the course of this book, Harry Kim is an ensign in every single one of them. That's as, just, that's just the law, be. except Absolutely. for that one where he was a captain for about five minutes in a vault in a timeline that got reset. So, you know, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the real reason Admiral Janeway went back in time to reset it. She didn't want to live in a world. To reset it, to make him an ensign again. I mean, we find out that him getting a lieutenant's pip is like yeah. the, 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 the EMP of the entire timeline or something. Just get, it has to be undone. So. <laughs> oh, poor Harry. <laughs> now, is the USS Tempest that reference from Star Trek Online? I don't know if it is. 
It might be. I think they had they had a fleet of Wells class starships, and I know they had a couple in Star Trek Online. So I may have I may have lifted that one from memory beta or something because I was trying to come up with. I don't need to invent one if they've already. If there's one out there that's been created, I'll reference it. You know, it's like it's. Uh, I even threw in a reference to um, the Prometheus. You know, from the trilogy uh, uh, that was written by the two British authors. You know, the, the, and they did their you know level best to tie their storyline into the lit verse. I don't know if they're as w- widely read as some of the books that are in the series right proper, but uh, I read the three books and, you know, they did a, a very interesting job threading that particular needle. So I, I had a way to reference it briefly. So I tossed in a, I tossed in a reference just because, you know, a thank you, a nod of respect, whatever you want to call it. But as far as the Tempest, I, I think I may have pulled that one from an online resource, but I like the, the Crichton and the other one that I'm blanking on right now. I was just coming up with names of people who had written star, uh, timeline or time travel stories. You know, I thought it would be a fun mm-hmm. little Easter egg. So yeah, everybody's like, well, Michael Crichton wrote the most, you know, the worst time travel story ever. I'm like, yeah, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> He's going to die anyway. So he gets, his, he gets, his, you know, it's going to die anyway. So he gets his comeuppance. So, so yeah, with regards to the Prometheus, Bruce, we had a, a listener that was asking uh, something with regards to Worf and the Prometheus. Is that right? Yeah. And I think you basically answered it. And I think the question was revolving was this about Worf probably mm-hmm. taking over command of the yeah. ship? It was that something that was being planned as a oh. series or something to be done later in the timeline? But it doesn't sound like it sounds like it's something you just came up with. No. I mean, in my outline, I had him as he was he was going to be promoted and he was in line for a command. But making it the Prometheus was an audible that I called while I was actually writing the book. I'm like, I need a ship. What am I going to call it? And or which one am I going to give him? You know, and I'm like, which, you know, so I cast around for an idea. And, I, and for some reason, I was looking at my bookshelf and I saw the three books. I'm like, oh, there you go. There's a good one. <laughs> I'll use that one. So. <laughs> I see that a lot of thought was put into it. I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I was like, I just, I was casting about looking for something. I mean, I'm looking at memory beta and I'm looking at memory alpha and I'm like, none of these ships feel like something that Worf would command, you know, like I don't want to give Worf command of a science vessel. I don't want to give Worf command of a little exploratory scout. I want to give him something with some heft, but what mm-hmm. would be safe, you know, like what would be safe from a, you know, again, when I do that, everything's nice and normal for five minutes in this storyline. I just, I don't know. It just seemed like an opportunity to give a tip of the hat to the, to, to the, to the folks who wrote those books. Yeah. And those are good books. We enjoy. Yeah. Those. But I mean, I, I don't know that there's been any, any overt references to them in the, in the core lit verse books. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hard. Don't take my word for it. I don't know that there has been one, but maybe that one, somebody slid one in, but um, I don't know. I just like the idea of making sure that they got a, got a nod before we started killing everything. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the speculation that I see from fans online. Like there was somebody who is absolutely convinced that you had gotten a sneak peek at Michael Dorn's series plans and borrowed that from that. And that was going to be the Captain Wharf series. I hadn't seen that one. That's pretty funny. That's actually funny. I, um, I, no, I wish I was that. I wish I had that kind of access, but no, I no. That's a great. That's a great one, though. That's a. I did not see that one, but that's a great one. I thought that was pretty clever. I thought there was no way, but it was I mean, nice even if even if sure. such a show existed, <laughs> there's no way they would let me do that. They would have. They would have like we would prefer you not. Do mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, and maybe I would have tried to sneak it in the back door when nobody was looking, but I would have paid dearly for that transgression at some point. So, um. You mentioned that, you know, there was that bit of normalcy and stuff before uh, everything starts going to hell and everybody starts getting killed. And uh, we should probably talk about that a little bit because, (laughs) and I've I've got this question worded here as uh, how could you do this to us? But fair enough. That's not serious. But uh, we do see several character deaths uh, for me, most distressingly until the very end of the novel, of course, which we'll get to. But uh, Teresa Chen is a huge one. Yes. Torek, Dina Elfiki, Konya, so many of these characters. And I know that the nature of the story with timelines and branches and that kind of thing, there, there's a bunch of stuff going on. But what was that experience like kind of going in with a um, I don't know, a scythe here. <laughs> and, well, I mean, and, yeah. Uh, okay. So doing these characters in when we were developing the storyline and I was, and I was 
talking with my editor about it. It's like, you know, how much time do I spend on on the characters before things start going to hell? You know, and 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 it, and it occurred to me while I was talking with her that this very well may, may be the last time I get to write for these characters, you know, the or or this version of these characters. It's like it's very it's entirely possible. It's such a little bittersweet, you know. It's like I I have grown to to really love writing Teresa Chen. Um, she's my favorite of the, of the, of the characters that were created to fill, you know, the roster spots for the next gen characters that have moved on. So, and I have particularly enjoyed her relationship with Picard. I, we've talked about that before mm -hmm. previous interviews about how I view that relationship and how much fun it is. So I knew that if, if, if something like that was going to happen in this storyline, it had to be me that did it. I just want, I wanted to make sure I wanted to be the one to do it. Not because I relished the idea. I just thought, well, that's a great place to leave that for me since I've written her character several times at this point. Um, and the same thing with, you know, the other characters, it's like, yeah, I'm never gonna, I very well may never write for these, this version of the characters. So I want to spend some time with them before I start torturing them. Uh, it is perhaps self-indulgent but that's okay that's why i get to write the book <laughs> so but what did you find it necessary that you had to kill off characters i don't care what characters we're talking about but to up the stakes of what's going on did you have to bring death into the story we talked about it for a while we were talking you know one of the things we talked about early on meaning we meaning jim dave myself and our editor margaret clark was that this has to be visceral it has to be a gut punch it has the stakes have to be high it has to be like you know we were the closest parallel i guess that people are drawing is crisis on infinite earth but we were also looking at you know Endgame, the avengers movie uh, infinity war and Endgame is like this is you know the stakes were high and prices you know the price was high the cost was great for them to attain victory so we wanted something like that you know how it all plays out well you know again there are two more books coming so brace yourselves um but i mean it's it's a it's a we wanted a huge story with you know lots of lots of sacrifice lots of heroic deeds and you know the, the stakes being the highest they may have ever been uh and you can't do that without punching people in the throat a little bit along the way you know you just have to kind of do it i don't particularly enjoy killing off popular characters I mean, it's not something i make a habit of uh so for me it was a little bit outside my wheelhouse but you know dave dave coached me through it <laughs> <laughs> Good old <Dave. laughs> no no i mean i mean i've killed off a couple of people in like the vanguard books and, and you know the red shirt deaths and i mean that but those things are kind of the matter of course that's star trek but um this was a little different yeah mm -hmm. speaking of end game i kept thinking of that of it occasionally because of the dust when somebody dies is was that inspired from that maybe a little bit but it was obviously we tried to you know the method of delivery is a little different the idea that they age so rapidly in such a such a brief period of time it's like well we you know it's they just crumble to ash you know that seemed to be the most easily described in a quick manner element you know way of doing this uh i'm sure it was an inspiration because like i said end game was was we even called this our this is our end game we have to do something like that on that scale you know we have to we have to really swing for it something that i've seen brought up elsewhere and uh i've, I've also heard that your answer to this is kg and you Kind of, but I, I just have to put it out there because people have brought it up to me, and that's uh, Agent Rangea of the DTI. In previous novels, um, he should be already uh, dead by this point. By this point, in we get to the novels, but he is in this novel and gets a death scene here as well. Should he? Is he? Did he? Hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's about what I've heard from other sources as well. So. Okay, well, okay. going on that theme, there's something I do want to make a comment on. So, you know, I see people online, say, and, and even Dan said earlier, how dare you? How, how could you do this? How could you kill these characters? <laughs> For me, it wasn't that emotional because the way this story is playing out, and we're referring to alternate timelines, timelines branching and all these things, We've seen even at the beginning, towards the beginning, Wesley dying, but then Wesley's here again. And it's like, to me, it, it doesn't quite feel final. Is that fair for me to say? It's fair for me to say that you feel it does not feel final. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that it's just that 
I guess because I know this is the last book that it doesn't hurt me that some of these characters are dying off because I know we're not going past this anyway, you know? So that Mm -hmm. for me is why it didn't hit me so emotionally. It was interesting. And I actually, every time someone died, I'm like, wait, did they die? And I had to go back and reread that part again. This is just my comments, my review. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for any feedback or anything. Thank you very much. It was a good day. (laughs) Thanks everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one one thing that I wanted to comment on and just what I thought was a, a, a kind of small highlight of the novel was uh, the the return of Captain Riker and the 1701D that we saw from the alternate timeline from your novel Headlong Flight uh, with Tashiar, of course, being on the bridge there as well. And that kind of being put into the first contact encounter, the battle at Earth, the battle of Sector 001. I thought that was really interesting and a lot of fun and uh, kind of putting that into that time period and Riker getting the specs for the transphasic torpedoes from Picard because there's this big, huge Borg battle coming. And I'm like, this isn't the Borg battle. This isn't the big one yet, though, is it? So I, I thought that was really interesting. And, and was that kind of a bit of an intentional uh, dramatic irony for the reader reading that? Well, I mean, I think <clears throat> going back to Headlong Flight, which is that stuff book was published four years ago, the idea that I might be able to revisit this version of the crew uh, was something that I had put a pin in. And, you know, of course, the, the obvious answer is that Picard gave, right, our Picard gave that Riker the plans to, for the mm-hmm. transphasic torpedoes because of their, what he thought would be their version of what happens in Destiny. Um, right. So... At, at the appointed place in time, this would be the weapon of choice. Um, that was, that was, that's the obvious answer to why he gave Riker that now, now of course things could unfold completely differently in that timeline. Um, so I left it vague uh, on purpose in case I ever got a chance to revisit it. And when it became apparent that we weren't going to be revisiting that, at least on its own novel, the need for an alternate version of the crew to be able to demonstrate an alternate timeline presented itself in our storyline. I'm like, well, I've already created this version of the characters. They've already been, They've already been written about. I can just pick up that thread a little bit later. That was the motivation for using them in this book. Um, obviously, I had different plans, maybe one day, that kind of thing. Nothing was really concrete. I had, I had like four or five different things that I was thinking I might be able to do at some point in a future book that, you know, will, <laughs> at least so far as I know, will not be realized anytime soon. Well, uh, I guess we'll talk about the the final big shocking moment of the novel of course and i'm sure you've been asked millions of times about this moment but captain ezri dax of course seems to meet her final fate in this novel as well and i've got to imagine that's got to be a different experience for you because of this being you know a canon star trek character a long-running character we've seen on the television show uh, writing her final moments or or what seem to be her final moments in this novel. How is that experience different from, you know, writing other character deaths or other other things that have happened in the novels? Well, the stakes are a little different. And again, you know, because like you said, the, we were talking about a, a, a character who originated on screen. Of course, I did that to Torek, you know, a while back, but he's a little... That's, That's true, a little yeah. bit different scale, I think. I don't, I don't think Torek and Ezri are on the same playing field. I think Ezri's got a, <laughs> got, a, got a bit of a, a lead there. For me, it was different because I've I've joked in the past when asked about would I kill a canon character given the opportunity. I'm like, well, if the story demanded it or, you know, I, I had a reason to do that and I could get it approved. Yeah, I'd do it. But I don't I never set out to do it. I never set out to write a story where I would do that. Um, this is the first time that that sort of thing kind of presented an opportunity, so to speak. But again, if you don't like me after what I did in that book, (laughs) I'm the lowest (laughs) level intensity setting of the trilogy. So, um, you're going to probably, but again, it's, it's that sort of stakes. We went by doing that with a Canon character. The idea was to communicate that this is, this is a big deal. This is the, you know, the stakes are very high. And uh, the cost for victory is going to be expensive. Now, the idea is not to pummel the fans with, you know, despair and angst and, you know, sorrow, obviously, you know. But I think if you write a story on this kind of scale and you don't have costs, you know, then it's sort of hollow. You know, we get Mm -hmm. enough reset buttons on TV uh, and in a lot of the novels that we, you know, so it's like, well, 
an opportunity has presented itself where we are not faced with a reset button. What are we going to do with it? Okay. Well, now I heard it. Ezra Dax really is dead. No. Did I say that? I never said that. I never said a word. You're talking like she's dead. I mean, of course I I am. I'm trying to get you to read books two and three. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, one final thing, and and you brought this up earlier, the idea of um, you being told basically to swing for the fences. And you mentioned that in the afterword. Uh, that you and your fellow authors were kind of given that directive. Was there anywhere you felt that the story wasn't able to go that you kind of wanted to do with it? Or uh, were you mostly allowed to kind of proceed with, uh, you know, pretty much unfettered with how you wanted it to unfold? Without going into details, because again, I don't want to spoil books two and three or anything about there were, you know, there was a lot to work with, a lot of material contributed by, you know, all those authors over the course of so many years. And some of it was, some of it had been tied off. Some of it had been left hanging. Some of it would have been left in a state where it could go either way. And we had to make choices on what we chose to include and what we had to kind of let go. They were painful conversations on a couple of them. Uh, It's like, I really wanted to include this. Well, there's really no really good place to do that. You know, that kind of thing. Um, Just a lot of moving pieces around, trying to balance the needs of every, of each book and, and balance everything across the three stories and, and, and serve the entire storyline. Yeah. It was just, there were choices had to be made. I don't think there's any one right answer to how we did this. There's no one, you know, I'm sure there's going to be somebody out there who's upset that something wasn't done a particular way, or this character didn't get a particular spotlight or, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, if we had, if we had sat around trying to figure out all of that, we'd still be sitting around, you know, and we started talking about this in in the summer of 2019. So it's, it's I, at some point, I think we just had to, we, we, we decided this is, this is our scope. These are the stakes in the ground. This is where we have to operate in. And this is what we're going to do and hope it works out. Of course, you know, now it's up to us. Now it's, no, it's out of our hands. Now it's up to you all to decide if we did that or not. We'll let you know. There you go. I'll talk to you in January, <laughs> right? We're all going Absolutely, to hiding, yes. whichever. We'll all go into hiding. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I blame all these character deaths on Kirsten Beyer anyway, because she had the power to go in there and say to these showrunners, we can make Picard fit into the novel timeline. And she didn't make that happen. So this is a result of that. It's a so conversation I'm with you and her. Kirsten. Feel free to bring Kirsten on and tell her that so that she can reach I, through I the screen. I did <laughs> once. So. Dan, did I kind yeah, of mention that? Good, to her? good luck with that. I think Bruce. I did say something to her once about that. So. <laughs> she would take it all in she stride. She hasn't been on she's, since. She's, hmm. she's uh, you know, she would. I think she would take it all in stride. I well, she kind of led me to believe that she's not in power either. <laughs> so <laughs> she doesn't have the ultimate say so on everything that shows up on screen in Star Trek. She does not have the ultimate say so. So yeah, she's not the ab. She's not the it's final crazy. arbiter of such things. So it's easy for her to say. I'm good with that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Because there's somebody else to blame. Maybe, you know, or if if you want to, if you want to direct your ire, there are other targets. Well, uh, to the both of you, is there anything uh, that we haven't mentioned yet with regards to this novel that uh, you'd like to bring up? The only thing I want to bring up is I love the line where Teresa Chen says, Hey, you know, second contact is pretty important too. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That was terrific. I hadn't (laughs) intended to, to do that it just kind of popped out while i was writing the scene i had a very vague notion of where she was going to go next and as i was writing it i'm like well this basically sounds like second contact uh juicier and meatier but basically it boils down to being second contact so then i been then it became how do i work a reference in you know and uh so i i think i played with it for an hour or so before i remembered the line and i'm like oh there you go that's how i work it in yeah i mean i had to get at least one easter egg for lower decks in there somewhere yeah so that reminds me of something else i wanted to ask you did you want to because since i've read the book i know that you haven't but did you consider the idea of bringing a character from lower decks or picard that's unique to those series into this book in like a cameo to say oh, that character existed in this timeline maybe i did and you didn't even know it did i miss it come on you gotta tell me if you're not gonna tell me on the show you have to tell me afterwards <laughs> two more books to read all will be answered in time all will all will be answered in time i don't mean that as a right. pun either that, that i just realized i came out as really <laughs> and i'm like no, no 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 that's not what i meant but you understand what i mean yeah Yes. All yeah. Right. The, if there were agents of the DTI here, they'd just give you a side. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a menace. Oh. 
Well, um, I'm, I'm sure to be continued, of course, like I, I really do want to follow up with you at some point after all is said and done. So uh, we'll have to make plans for that for sure. Uh, but in the meantime, um, is there anything that you're currently working on right now uh, that our listeners would be interested in? I am in the midst of feverishly trying to finish up something for the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game. If I can get it knocked out in the next week or so, because then I set my sights on another much larger project that I, I can't talk about yet. And then, of course, I'm still doing the, the consulting bit for CBS. Um, so I'm still reading everything and anything that comes across my desk that's star trek related there's it's all star trek all the time here at ward manor every time that uh spock's brain device pops up on your facebook timeline i get excited so i know you've got your fingers in stuff that i would just like give my left kidney to i mean it, it's i think it's more exciting <laughs> than it sounds to to the to, i mean not that what i do is boring by any stretch but it's not like i like you know like a lot like Kirsten, but to an even greater degree, I don't really have any power. <laughs> just, I'm just a guy who reads right. stuff and makes <laughs> notes, you know, that kind of thing. And then I do other oddball tasks as requested. Uh, but a lot of the time I'm reading, um, I'm reading scripts, I'm reading manuscripts, I'm reading outlines, I'm reading comic book scripts. Uh, I'm reading things for games and other interactive experiences that may or may not come to fruition. It's uh I'm writing copy for museum exhibits or Comic-Con things or, you know, like the thing that showed up at New York Comic-Con um, last earlier in the month. You know, the, the, the flight simulator for Prodigy, there's a bunch of stuff that gets thrown at you on the screen. And um, I got asked to tweak hmm. that and make it a little more Star Trek-y. <laughs> so, you know, they gave me the original script and I kind of like tweaked some of the dialogue and read out stuff. It was like, but I mean, a lot of that stuff is just un, unsung hero, un, un, uncredited work. Un, un, yeah. So it's just, I'm just there. I'm everywhere, apparently. That's so cool, though. <laughs> that sounds like a fun job to me. I mean, maybe it's not all that fun all the time, but it is fun. Don't get me wrong. I, just, I don't look at it as I've got to do this today. I, I look at it as yeah. I get to play with Star Trek today. That is cool. I like that. So is there a chance awesome. we'll see you at Star Trek Mission Chicago in April? There's a very good chance if for no other reason than it's a train ride away for me. It's, you know, it's a five or six hour train ride from Kansas city to Chicago. So I will, right. I will most likely be there in some capacity. Oh, very cool. Awesome. And uh, in the meantime, though, if people want to kind of follow your exploits, where uh, would they be able to find that out? You can still find me at Daytonward.com. I know I'm all about the really crazy, um, hard to figure out names. <laughs> um, and you'll find my social media links there. So I'm Dayton Ward on Facebook. I'm Dayton Ward on Twitter. I'm Dayton Ward underscore KC on Instagram. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any luck with code, cool code names. Yeah. Daytonward.com. That's your, that's your launch pad. Excellent. And yeah, so to our listeners out there, go pick up this novel. I really enjoyed it. We, we focused on a lot of, you know, I, hopefully you've read it. Like, I don't know why you're listening at this point if you haven't read the novel, but uh, I loved it. I thought it was terrific. I'm just jonesing bad for the next two chapters of this particular story. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Um, Bruce, where can people find you online? Well, I read the novel too, just so you guys know, <laughs> just, <laughs> and I really liked it and I skimmed through it a second time. So that's how much I liked it, but you can find me on Twitter, not at Bruce Gibson. Cause that was already taken. So I had to get clever and it's Admiral underscore Rex. That's Admiral with the underlying Rex. And you can occasionally hear me on literary tracks and also on the Star Wars Report podcast. Excellent. You can find me on Twitter at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. Find the podcast on Twitter at Positively Trek. And uh, of course, if you are able and willing and uh, it's in the financial cards for you, patreon.com slash positively trek if you want to help out the podcast but if not don't worry podcast is free and always will be we really appreciate you just listening so thank you so much of course to my great co-host bruce gibson and our wonderful guest once again dayton ward love having you on the show every time it's always just such a, a treat to have you here and that you're willing to give your time to us. We really do appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. It's always fun. Well, thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, stay positive. Stay positive.